and it took me forever to download that solar dynamic observatory sun, 10 years of the sun. Thank <laughs> you.
Adam Roberts here with Explore Scientific, and this is the Explore Alliance live broadcast of the Open Go To community. And uh, today with me is um, Gary Hubble, Tyler Bowman, and you know one of our alumni, Kent Martz. And so we're we're all here to uh, uh, share some of our day here with you in advance of the Global Star Party number thirteen. And so which will happen tonight at eight o'clock. I understand somebody said here in the chat that we are uh, um, uh, competing against a SETI live cast that's going on right now. So, you know, <laughs> that's hard to beat, you know, so. <laughs> anyway. Well, maybe we can find some intelligent life here. <laughs> Very thin in rare form today. <laughs> You'll find out later why, okay, because, uh, He's, he's read that there are other planets better than ours, so, um, and he's got an opinion about it. So. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, today, uh, you know, I'm excited because we've got some great people coming up on the Global Star Party. Uh, Mike, Mike Wiesner is going to be joining us. Uh, this will be, I think, his first, it's not his first time to be on one of our programs, but it's his first time to uh, be on the Global Star Party. So he's kind of figured out uh, how to connect, uh, I guess, out by his observatory dome. So that's gonna be really cool. Uh, Kelsey Poor from Nova Graphics is uh, confirmed with me earlier that she's joining us. Um, we're gonna see Jason Genzel back, the vast reaches. He's coming back uh, this afternoon as well. So that's really cool. Um, and we've got a number of other regulars. I'm sure Richard Grace will be there, hopefully David Ng. Um, and uh, you know uh, a lot of the other familiar faces that you see on our prog program, including David Levy, Kelly Beatty, and Libby in the stars. So, I'm. Um, I'm uh, what does Kelly's talk tonight? How far along is he in his talk? This is like sixth or seventh, right? The sixth installment of his seven-part series. So, uh, he mentioned something about either like being apprehensive about giving the sixth installment or something, or. You know, because now he's like predicting, I think, into the future a little bit. So because I think he kind of did the current state of where we are, gave us a nice history leading up to where how we got here. But uh, now he's um, maybe he's starting to thread into some, uh, you know, unfamiliar territory or something, because that's the future, right? All of it's going to be unfamiliar. But it's, it's kind of easy to know that there'll probably most likely be more computerization in our telescopes. There'll be more imaging in our telescopes, uh, more robotic remote control with our telescopes. More you know, social, social interaction, social media integration. Exactly, sharing that stuff. And that will help, you know, not only just casual astronomy uh, or making beautiful images, but for science too, you know, because uh, you do need the social interaction to share ideas and to share data. So, um, you know, once you have a, you know, uh, a lot more good minds working on a problem, uh, hopefully you're able to figure out a way to solve that problem better or faster, you know, so, but, um, uh, like the $6 million man. <laughs> yeah. Now better and stronger, faster or man. Right. So, right? A million dollars. I mean, that's what it costs to get knee replacements now, I think. So, you know, so you're not, you're not going to be running faster, jumping further, you know. So, but uh, who was the actor that played that guy? Um, Lee remember, Majors. I, yeah. Okay. So I remember watching Lee Majors like on Johnny Carson or something at one point, he was blasted drunk. I mean, he was just almost falling off of the chair drunk. And I was like, how do they let a guy like this on television, you know, but. They're probably all like that. Well, maybe, you know, how do rock stars get up on stage? How did Keith Richards stay on stage? That's what I want to know. Yeah. Speaking of rock stars, Eddie Van Halen died today, just announced. Really? really? 60, 65 years old. Goodness. Yeah, I think he battled cancer or something at one point. I'm not sure. That's too bad. Great guitarist. Well, Kent, uh, since you haven't been with us for a while, why don't you, uh, why don't you tell people what, where you've been, what you've been doing? Well, right now I'm looking up what $6 million would be worth today. 
just to see. Uh, he would now be the thirty-six million dollar man. The thirty-six million <clears throat> would be the name of the show. Somehow, it's the thirty-six million dollar man doesn't have quite the same ring. But anyway, um, since probably the last time I was on, I've moved over to specialty dealers uh, manager uh, with the company and spent a lot of time working with the dealers to get products in uh, to our customers' hands and uh, uh, processing orders and just. Uh, um, you know, dealing with, with the questions that come through the dealers and uh, helping out the other CSRs here with my knowledge when they have a, a, a thorny question or a problem they can't come up with, I will take a stab at it as well. I'm still, I basically just moved over one desk and still in the cubicle farm and uh, love being out here in, in the bullpen with everybody. Um, yeah. Even even Tyler, who's basically across the wall from me. So I even have to put up with him, but it's not too bad. Goodness. Um, so, um, so that's uh, that's great. And what what what's been your greatest challenge so far dealing with uh, in this, in specialty sales? Uh, data entry and learning learning computers the computer system and you know integrating you know higher levels of of Excel than I was used to. You, you know, actually programming. I've used some of those, the, the tools, in, in, but I've never actually had to build them and, you know, learn how to build them. It's been a great experience. You know, it's every, everything's a new challenge. And, you, you know, if you learn something every day, it's been a great day. And I've had a lot of great, great, great days because uh, Scott, you've made me learn a lot of things every day. And so <laughs> by moving to this role, so I appreciate your opportunities. You've given me to learn more. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it, it, it's, it's uh, a, not stepping in, you know, automatically with the CSRs is, is maybe the biggest challenge for me from a personal standpoint, because it's really easy for me to go, hey, say this, you know, or do something like that, where they have to to learn how to, to do that stuff and, you know, stepping in at the right times to help. And then, you know, just not being able to talk to people that I've talked to on the telephone so much, because if I did that, especially in this stage of the new job, I wouldn't get my new job done. And so that, that's been hard uh, for people who are used to calling me. You know, so well, and, um, and to jump over to something else. But, uh, you know, I always found that to be also exciting uh, to, you know, be faced with new challenges and stuff. And you've done it very well. And so uh, dealers have uh, lots of good things to say about you, and they know you're, you work hard for them. And, um, you know, but, uh, you know, you never, you never uh, uh, jump completely away from uh, customer service once you've been in it. Um, you know, I, even myself, I mean, even what we're doing right now, you know, this is also part of our customer service activities, you know, so. Well, and a lot of people don't know, but Scott will answer the phone. You know, it'll be, I'll, it'll be up here and the phone will ring on a Saturday and Scott may answer it, you know, or Friday afternoon or something and he'll, they'll ask questions and. Well, I and will it's the customer that pays my paycheck. So yeah, you're the boss. <laughs> the customers are the boss. You know, I always say that we're the janitors for the brand. That's exactly what we are. You know, so we just have to be here to take care of the customer and to make sure that they have a great experience and uh, and that we always do the right thing by them. So that's that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. So. Uh, before we get into a, 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 the land of controversy here, how about if we talk to Tyler Bowman, okay, uh, and um, and find out what's happening in uh, the world of uh, customer service and tech support? Uh, uh, still helping everybody okay. connect the ASIR Pro to the PMC eights, which I I think I need to do a video on that. I really do. Yes, yeah, so now you're the ASIR Pro, right? Thank you, Jerry. You're the best. <laughs> um, I, I can't spell ASIR. Uh, I'm sure you can, buddy. Sure what's so What's so hard about it, Tyler? Uh, it's just when you when you try to switch the FTDI chip, you got to make sure that your PMC8 is in serial mode for it to connect and communicate with the ASIR, either the pro or the regular standalone version. Um, and that's that's the main hangup on some people is they can't make sure they don't make sure that it's actually in serial mode um, beginning because once you switch the FTDI chip you cannot communicate with the, the PMC8 anymore 
Um, so you would have to revert it back to the original signal that it came in. And then you communicate, switch to serial, go back to DTR. Then you can hook up the ASI air and voila, it's, magic. It's good to have. It's good to have two cables, not just one. Yeah, it is good to have two. I, I have two or three or four. I have a bunch. Um, but yeah, it is very. So handy when to you have say more. when you say switch to the DTR, you're physically taking the cable apart and moving it. No, you or use it a program. A pro, it's a program called FT under under hyphen proc. Um, and you can switch or invert the RJ232 signal um, in the programming and you just select the DTR box. And then once you do that and hit program, it will program the DTR signal into the FTDI chip, uh, which allows you to communicate within the ASIR Pro. Just, so. just as a quick aside, there's a difference between the way Linux handles the communications drive with the driver in the Linux box and the way Windows handles the, the RS-232 signals. So that's the reason that you have to do that switch. Michael Fulbright identified that early on when he created the Indy driver. So many people do you think that buy an ASI Air run into problems versus people I, it works right off the top? I took it upon myself to email ASI Air because I have contacts there. And I gave them detailed instructions what I have to do because nowhere on their site or their instruction manual shows you how to do it. Um, so, and this, granted, this is just with the XOS 2 and the G11s that people are having these issues with, not the IXOS 100s, because they have those instructions in on their website, just not the other two mounts, which though those are the more used mounts, uh, more heavier duty mounts that can be used for I'm not saying the IXOs 100 can't be used for astrophotography, but those are just the more ones that are used that we have sold the most of. Okay. All right. So um, well, that's great uh, that, that you're able to help them wade through all this, uh, you know, the, the, the complexity of that. I guess that we should probably put some sort of instructions uh, either on our side or on the open go-to forum somewhere. We do. We have them on the, the group's I.O. Um, there's been a couple collaborations with Jerry and I and other members of the group's I.O. That they're all, right. They're also on the ND website where, they, mm -hmm. where you download the driver. Mm -hmm. Michael Fulbright put full instructions there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess a lot of people just jump in without reading any instructions like I would do, right? Yeah. So I would be a great candidate for a phone call to uh, Tyler. That's why you employ me. When I buy my ASI Air, I can get help. Just That's throw right. the box at me and say, here, fix it. Fix it. That's right. Which is what actually happening with my telescope right now. So the, you notice that behind me is, a, is another telescope. This is an XOS2 with a uh, uh, AR102 telescope riding up on top of it. Um, my ED102 SCD100 as um, actually they've made some progress on it. They're, you know, they're using the uh, uh, USB powered USB hub that uh, Denny uh, uh, Shelley had recommended that I buy. Uh, thank you very much if you're watching. Um, and um, uh, we are trying to figure out all the cable management for power and just uh, running from my NUC to my cameras and all of that, so. I guess before we give it the final blessing that uh, we, uh, you know, probably have. That's what it's talking about. I was like, what's going on? Okay. You can take a look at it too, and see what you think. I'll do that from now on. I'm going to have cables that aren't going to get all over the place. So, um, I'll meet your mic. One for it to just like a tangled mess, <laughs> you know. So, all right. Uh, I had. Uh, Kent, I had put up the page for um, uh, the observatory tent, the two-room observatory tent. You want to pull that page up and share share that with the uh, group, and we can talk a little. Sure, bit. I'll be happy to. Give me a second. Yeah, give you a second. I thought you would already have it up. Scott's Scott's notorious for that kind of stuff. I, I thought by now you could read my mind. So, yeah. 
Gordon Lightfoot wrote a song like that. Did he? That's why he drinks heavily. Yes. You know what? Gordon Lightfoot is actually a relative of mine. My mother's maiden name is Lightfoot. Are you finding yeah. it? It should be up, Scott. I've started screen sharing, I think. Uh, you have not started screen sharing. There we go. There we go. There we are. Okay. So we put down some of the information. We'll be putting down more information about the uh, two-room observatory tent. Um, uh, we are, you know, we have promised um, Explore Alliance members that we would give them, uh, you know, advance notice of product and advance um, uh, an opportunity to get the, the product at, uh, you know, an early buy-in price. Now, we won't have these, don't, these observatories probably until, I'm thinking December uh, at this point, maybe early December. Um, but uh, we are going to send out a mailing to all of our Explore Alliance members. So if you have not joined the Explore Alliance, you can do so for free, or you can become a uh, you can become a base member or a platinum member if you want. Um, and uh, uh, you can take advantage of the deal that we're going to offer for this. We're not going to say what the deal is in, here on the air. Uh, you do need to go and sign up, uh, so you can go to uh, explorescientific.com. Here I'll put the. Uh, Scott, we'll be sending that email out tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, okay. You go to explorescientific.com forward slash alliance and join. If you want to join for free, you can join as a legacy member. Uh, if you join as a platinum lab, uh, member, you're going to get a hundred dollar. It costs a hundred dollars to join. You're going to get a hundred dollar gift certificate back, uh, plus all the platinum membership benefits that we have, which include uh, advanced product replacement and a bunch of other really cool stuff. Um, uh, you know, uh, I will also add that we are, uh, uh, we are uh, members of the Night Sky Network and we work very closely with the, uh, with the Astronomical League as well. And so, um, and uh, you know, all the things that we're doing are pretty much under the Explorer Alliance umbrella. Um, but uh, can you we'll, scroll through the pictures. Well, some of the other pictures. I was just doing that. Yeah. So that's the that's the the, the uh, tent with the doors closed. The the doors down. So that um, you know, if you have you just have them, uh, you don't have the door rolled up. The the fabric will go just just hang down like a curtain, and you can uh, pass through it if you want to. Have it open. Uh, you can you can roll it up, and there's a little tie off. Uh, and and there's an interior door that goes between these two rooms. Right. So there's a door just like this one that goes into this room. So I think of this as like uh, the warm room, or where you can have your computer, or uh, you know, uh, a desk with table with maps and stuff on it. And you can step into this room and where the telescope is. And these are uh, five by five, is right, Scott? And they're five feet tall to this wall. Yeah, it's five and then six feet tall to the arch, arch wall. So you can use that as kind of a additional light block, you know, or if you got wind kind of blowing from that direction. And, and Scott and I struggled to put these up last night. Uh, we decided to put them up and they're right behind Tyler. It took us, it was tough. Uh, it took us about... 45 seconds. Is that what it was? Yeah. 40, yeah, we were trying to get it down in 10 seconds, but yeah. It just, no. they went to, they went up just like that. They just pop open and they're done. And it folds. So you take it, you take it from the sides, you know, you take it from the sides, and then you twist it, and then it rolls into like this disc. This disc is only 34 like, inches around. 27 inches in diameter. 27. And it's about the two tents, because it's a two-room tent, okay, hold down to about, you know, all collapse and everything, maybe three or four inches. It's flexible, of course, you know, so you can you can pack it into your car and you can pack stuff around it and stuff like that. 
And then there's so, go ahead. So I got a question. So how so is this easy to what I would suggest I thought I'm thinking about it. You want to set up your telescope first and lift it up over your telescope and set it down. Is that how you want to do it? So you have more room to set up your telescope, or do you you think you go inside there and set up your telescope? Uh, this first room right here that you can see my cursor on, Velcro's. It's a this part of it. The, the right. telescope part is a three sided piece. Oh, okay. That then so you could actually open that up and scoot it around your telescope and then close it. Absolutely. How you do it? Absolutely. Some guys are going to buy more than one of these and connect them together because they're inexpensive. Uh, they offer reasonable wind protection. Uh, it is a uh, it's it's a coated um, uh, dent material, so it's completely blacked out. Okay. And uh, waterproof. Waterproof, and then we give you a a a. a for the better part, you know, it, it's a roof that goes over the whole top of it. And, uh, you know, so if you get a surprise shower or if it's really dewy out or something like this, you know, um, after you're done observing, you can just protect your scope and keep the dust off and the, the moisture out. Um, I do recommend putting down a ground cloth. Just get a, you know, go to uh, Harbor Freight or something like that and, and get a large ground cloth to... Uh, put down on the ground and then put the tent down on top of it. Uh, this would keep you from uh, only finding out, out in the middle of the, you know, in the in the late hours of the evening as your polar aligning or something that uh, you don't have fire ants climbing up your legs or something. So, uh, you know, it's could you see could you see a bunch of these connected together out in the field like a snake or something? That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. You know? Or a bunch of a habitat that's got a bunch of these rooms all connected together or something. Yeah, it, it, it's you know you would you're going to have to have ways to get in and out of it. You know, so I was I haven't quite worked that out yet. But uh, that's maybe the second iteration. But it comes as the two rooms are part of the same kit. So when you buy it, you're getting the two room assembly and the tarp, all the guy wires and set of ground stakes. Um, I envision, uh, you know, to keep the dew off the computer and your maps and everything, if you're going to use it for AP, is using the dew shield folded out back <clears throat> so that it's covered up. So the door room where the door is is covered, and yeah. then your telescope is uncovered. So you're not fighting dew and moisture, you know, in your in your um, interior room. Are the rooms are the rooms the same size? Yes. Say it again. I said oh. I asked if the rooms were the same size. Yes, they're five foot by five foot. So you have with the two rooms together, you got 50 square feet inside of there. Okay. So you got lots of room to set out your computer gear, or you could set up two telescope systems if you want. Or if you're in a dog house, you got somewhere to sleep. <laughs> well, that's what the guy said on the test. He said, if I buy uh, he says, if I buy one more thing, I'll be sleeping in this thing. So, um, but the great thing is, is that you can sleep in it. If we you got want. you covered. Because uh, it's smaller. And if you're a tall guy, you might be a little bit in a somewhat fetal position, you know, uh, but it's worth it, you know, so, <laughs> you know, but I could see this, you know, set up. And if you're really outdoors, you know, you go to one of those really great dark sky sites and there's no facilities. Uh, this is this is great. This is nice, and I think that you know um, I, every astronomer wants to have an observatory of some sort, you know. But you know you got to build the building, right? And then you got to get power to it, and you have to maybe you have to get uh, you know uh, you know the building uh, uh, permits and all of those things uh, that might need to be uh, had. Um, even if you buy one of the prefab uh, observatories, um, you know, you still have to have a, you know, foundation maybe to set it on, um, these kinds of things. So it gets a little expensive. Uh, you can do it inexpensively in materials and stuff. If you looked at what the MSRO did, uh, you guys spent, what, about $1,000 on? $1,000 in materials, and we 
built it ourselves, uh, our own design with the, uh, and the, the walls, the walls were panelized. So they did bolt together, all the walls bolt together. So it's easy to take it apart. Right. But it was a thousand bucks in materials. How long did it take to build it? Um, about a week, a little over a week, I think. So we built it inside Myron's garage. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's right. But and then we pulled it apart and took it, the panels apart and took it out and put it back up. A lot of guys can't do that. Though. I mean, a lot of homeowners associations won't let you do it, you know, or if you are an apartment dweller, you know, you're not going to be able to do it. But having something to protect your equipment and most of you guys out there, you know, men and women out there that have our, have our telescopes and other telescopes, it, it's an, it's a sizable investment. You have into your gear. Uh, you've got electronics. Some of the electronics, like the PMC, it's designed to be outdoors. Laptops aren't really designed to be outdoors, you know. Uh, uh, so it's um, not not under a uh, a dewy uh, you know wet night for sure, you know. And so this would this could help you uh, in that regard. Hey Scott, uh, we had we've had some questions. Sure. Um, Jeff Weiss asked, what would you do on asphalt? And people said milk jugs, bricks, things like that. Sure. Um, I recommend the, um, I still recommend a, a tarp on the ground uh, just to protect the uh, bottom. You know, it's, it's, it's a pop-up tent. So this thing pops up and, you know, a matter of seconds and stuff. But the, uh, the metal bands uh, are encapsulated with the, with the tent fabric, you know, and you don't want to be, pulling the tent across, you know, you know, build, you know, one grit sandpaper, you know, which is what sand, uh, asphalt is, you know, so, you know, uh, uh, so you can, you can rip up the, uh, the bottom part of it if you do that. Uh, the only reason why I know that is because I've done it already with my samples. So Oops. I recommend to have a tarp, um, uh, you know, to protect the tent a little bit. And it, Parts are very inexpensive. M Michael Whitaker, Michael Whitaker, Whitaker asked how you polar line it. Well, you get out the. We do have a polar alignment scope that fits inside of it. You know, called a telescope uh, and an equatorial mount to align that, and then you just wrap a ring around it. That's, that's how you do it. Uh, talking about observatories, there's also some news looming there too, as well, for those people who might want a permanent observatory. Yes. You want to talk about that, Scott? That's true. Well, we've already had it up on the website for a while, and we've had our observatories already on order uh, from Pulsar Domes. And these are, uh, you know, high precision made uh, fiberglass domes. And so, um, yeah, you might want to share that. Uh, That's where I'm headed. So we're supposed to we're supposed to have those domes very soon. So we've already got some samples ordered. How There's soon is soon? And they they're they automated. There's an automation package for them, and uh, so that's uh, you know very nice to have. You know, uh, completely motorized. Um, um, you know, uh, opening on it and um, uh, very comfortable, you know. And, and they also sell sell piers and, and, and uh, right. uh, hardware to open and close domes and all sorts of things other than just the dome. Now, as it says here, and I don't know, I'm screen sharing if you shared my screen or not. Uh, yeah. The domes are made to order. So it's a, you know, a, a, a you know, a, Four, three months, four months turnaround. Well, the uh, that are coming in, uh, there's a no wait. And so you'll be able to get one right away from us. Cool. So, yeah. so we'll, we'll see how, how much of a demand there are for domes like this. I think it's going to be popular, but you can see that, that dome is $6,500, okay? Um, versus a, you know, an observatory tent, which is going to be, you know, tiny fraction of that price so is this an is this an a la carte thing where you buy the basic dome and then you add on things that extra part or is this a full full uh full it's all a la carte system? it's all a la carte, carte. Oh, okay mm -hmm. yeah, but you, they offer full systems 
you know, you buy the dumb controls and it's all, you know, it's all designed for it. So that's really cool. But uh, let's Can't see. wait to see it. Is this observatory compatible with a permanent pier or version two? Version two, what's a version two? I think it's something about if we come out with a version two oh, with okay. multiple doors or something. Uh, you know, if you can get the, the telescope in there around your permanent pier, that's fine. You know, if you would use it as kind of like a windbreak or something, you know, so that, that would be the, that would be the deal. But uh, we created at the MSRO, we created piers like for our LX200, meet LX200. It's low to the ground. It's only, the pier is only like two and a half feet tall. Right. And then it sits low. And then, and also, um, so if you have a short pier like that, then yeah, it should, but, but you want to get it high up enough, I guess, um, your telescope high enough above the uh, edge of the, you know, five foot level, I guess that's how tall it is, five feet. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Wise is saying that the dome disassemble easily. Uh, you know, I wouldn't take it to like a star party unless you're going to be there for a couple of weeks or something. Uh, because you're going to be spending probably at least all day getting your dome built and all day tearing the dome down, you know, and getting it stacked onto a trailer or something and then moving it out. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit of work. I know it took us at least a day to get the uh, technical innovations dome we have at the MSRO built and, you know, installed and aligned and everything. Oh, Jeff says, if you move. Yeah, Jeff, I mean, it's it's something you would take with you for sure, you know. Yeah, and uh, it, it'll take, it takes about a day, roughly a day to assemble it, and it would take roughly a day to disassemble it, so. That would be fun to show up at like the Nebraska Star Party or something with your own, with a, with a little observatory. You know, you can do it. We will take one to, um, uh, you know, the plan is to take one to Northeast Astronomy Forum, so we'll build our dome um, just before the show, and we really only get about two or three hours to uh, to get set up for that show. So we're going to have to have several people get on that thing immediately and build it out. So we're going to have to practice ahead of time then. Yes, you know, just... Let's see. The directions say take bolt one. Yeah, yeah, right. So, well, that's, that's, uh, that's that. So you guys can look forward to that email tomorrow if you're an Explorer Alliance member. So now we get to the part of our show where uh, things get a little weird and strange, okay? But Jerry Hubble is going to voice his opinion about planets that are better than Earth. What do you well, think? Yeah, so there's, I don't know how much of my opinion I'm going to state. I don't want to piss off people, but but this is just a, a strange story to me. So I'm going to share my, uh, I'm going to share my screen and share the story. Um. All right, you see that? Science Daily yeah. has this story that came out, I guess that's yesterday or to, yeah, yesterday. Some planets may be better for life than Earth, okay? So that caught my attention. <laughs> Researchers, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a pretty arrogant statement, right? Seems right. To me. But yeah. it says this, researchers have identified two dozen planets outside our solar system that may have may have conditions more suitable for life than our own. Some of these orbit stars that may be better than even our sun. All right. So <laughs> Earth is not necessarily the best planet in the universe, especially with all the crap that's going on today. Right. <laughs> Researchers have identified two dozen planets outside our solar system that may that may have conditions more suitable for life. So how much more suitable for life than we need to be? You know, that's the that's the issue. Suitable for life. You know. How much more suitable for life does this planet need to be? Does Earth need to be? That's the question I have. That would be nice. Um, so um, what is it? Oh, here's the, I just want to cover this first paragraph here. So, Wait. Go ahead. Go ahead. A study led by Washington State University scientists, I can't pronounce her name, recently published in the journal Astrobiology details characteristics of potential 
potential super habitable planets. These include those that are older, a little larger, and this is the statement that got me. Slightly warmer. Slightly warmer. Yeah. We're not warm enough on the Earth. So that, that tells me that they're not following the gospel <laughs> about, about global warming. Global warming, yeah. So that's just an interesting statement. So I, what do people think about this arrogant point of view that we, we, we've we already studied planets enough to know that they're more suitable than we are, than we have here on Earth. We don't know crap about these planets. Well, Mike Wiesner makes a good point. He says, as long as those planets are, will not support political life, then it could be better. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, well, that's right. But, but the thing is, you don't, you know, politicians are going to want it best for themselves, so they would take over any better planet than this planet and leave the crappy planets for the rest of us, right? Maybe it's a ploy to get them off this planet. Oh, that's an idea. Who knows? Well, I don't, to, I don't want to get into politics, but I just thought it was an interesting story, and that the it seems a little arrogant to me that we already understand enough to know when planets are better than the Earth. Well, I think that the story, first off, was mission accomplished. They got you to read it, okay? So, um, but, uh, That's what's know, a, Yeah, clickbait, clickbait, uh, clickbait headlines. Almost, yeah. It is kind of clickbaitish. That's true. That's true. That's true. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes scientists get things misconstrued, you know in an article so well you know having you know I, I spent, I spent, or you know what they asked him you know well could it be that there's better planets on earth and he's like oh well, you know there could be anything right okay write that down better than earth right so you would hope that someplace with a with a uh, url silence science daily news would mm -hmm. employ somewhat science literate writers however having spent a career in the newspaper industry, some literacy is better than other literacy for people. So, you know, and, and you write things to be, uh, nobody reads boring stories. No. And so there's that drive to jazz it up and spice it up, you know, yeah, it's it gonna, bleeds, it leads, uh, you know, there's some truth to that. You know, people, people don't will critic, criticize me for running stuff about that. But I would point out that they read it and they didn't like that point yeah. of order too much. When I'd say, well, you did read the story, right? And mm -hmm. there'd be a long pause and, you know, they pondered. Well, it's fine to read the story, but it, did I waste the, the last 10 minutes of my life reading that story? <laughs> you know, what value did it add to my life to know that? Well, you know, I think... I think it made for a good afternoon. It gave us something to talk about. Oh, yeah. Well, for this case, yes, absolutely. I thought it was just an... I, I'm just curious what the comments are about this story. I'd just be curious what people think. You know, it's just the comments here. You know, there is... Uh, uh, you know, this is a hangout for clicks, you know, clickbait. Um, Michael Whitaker says, fact is, we don't know. That's... The most honest answer right there. Uh, you'll never get the, these 10 minutes back either. <laughs> uh, what shall I, what shall I at a better planet uh, when maybe, uh, what shall I do on a better planet when maybe my feet are two meters long and one meter wide? I don't know what a pair, what a pair of shoes would cost then. Yes, so. But, it's uh, kind of like it's kind of like looking at the grass is always greener on the other side. It's that kind of point of view where you don't have it good enough. You, sh you can always try to go someplace else and get a, get better, get a better life or get a better thing, whatever it is. Right. Well, Jeff says he's ready to go. He says, sign me up for a trip. So so that's that's good. But uh, I suppose that at one point we are going to find uh, 
some planet that's got some sort of life on it, you know, and uh, that will be an amazing, amazing time. You know, we had a little uh, rush with it, with uh, the, you know, the idea that uh, phosphine exists in, uh, you know, the atmosphere of Venus um, and that phosphine may be a sign of, uh, of life, you know, uh, you know, microbial life. So that, that's, that's a, a very compelling and very interesting, uh, um, you know, piece of evidence. Um, but we won't know until we actually scoop something up that's alive and we're, we're examining something living, you know, so, and that's what all that activity to Mars is all about right now, uh, you know, to send more and more, um, you know, more rovers, more experiments to Mars, uh, because they think they're going to find some, some sort of evidence for life or that life did exact, uh, did exist there at one time. Uh, you know, and then we have, we have, uh, some moons that we'd like to visit too, um, that may be supporting life. And, uh, you know, and now with, uh, this evidence for Venus, uh, there's probably really good argument to go there for, you know, a sample mission or something to go into the atmosphere somehow of Venus and scoop it up and check it out, you know, so. Well, it's having read, I mean, getting to Venus and Mercury is hard. You know, Mars is, is hard and Mars eats, you know, probes, as, as we all know, it's, uh, you know, the percentages have not been good until the last few years, but the, the, the ability to get in with rockets is a huge, you know, it is rocket science to get there. And yeah. it's, it's amazing to read how, what we have to go through to, to reach the planets and slow down enough to be able to get, to, to get on them. Right. Yeah. You have to slow down your orbital velocity to get down into that. And the, the sun, the solar, what is it? What was this new solar probe that was just printed, that was launched last year. That's getting closer and closer to the sun. That's a lot of work. Parker solar probe. Yeah. Jenny, uh, Jenny Shelley says, the title of the article suggests they have definitive evidence there are other planets that are more habitable than Earth, yet they contradict the, their statement with using words like maybe and possibly, so. Right, that's right. That's why it's clickbait. That's why it's clickbait. Well, Speaking of clickbait, we have global star party 13 <laughs> happening. That's not going to be so clickbait. That's going to be a lot of fun. And hopefully all the people that we've invited show up. Um, one of them that I'm hoping uh, would be a surprise uh, uh, to all of us uh, uh, because she is so talented is Mary Craig. Uh, Mary Craig, I invited to be on the program. She is a harpist. She's a concert harpist and uh, she does beautiful music. Um, so I'm hoping that she makes it. Um, uh, uh, Norman Fulham will be joining us. Uh, Norman will probably play something for us or show us some of his uh, more creative work that he's done, which is really cool. Um, of course, we got the astrophotographers coming on. Um, what's your weather looking like out there, Jerry? It's looking good. In fact, uh, let me show you real quick. Um, let me share my screen for a second again. There's the observatory. I'm on it right now. Uh, you can see the you can see the scope there under the dome. So I'm prepared. The weather's supposed to be really good tonight. It's clear skies, Great. blue skies, and uh, we should be. Uh, I'm, I think. I think I talked to you yesterday. I'm going to demonstrate the diffuser and uh, the, the spectroscopy that we can do yes. with, uh, with the telescope. Now, how do you do the spectroscopy? Do you guys have a spectrograph or, or do you we have, have a grading? We have a grading spectrometer that's in the filter wheel. So it's a, it's a 200 line per millimeter grading that we, that we put in front of the camera and it, and it, of course, projects the, uh, spreads the light out and, and creates a spectrum about, I would say 30% of the width of the uh, camera field of view. Oh, wow. so you got the you got the zero order where the star is and then it spreads the light out and then you can do a measure, then you can analyze that image and, and 
uh, I can show some of that also probably a little bit. That's cool. That's cool. Well, that is another way that uh, they think they may find life on other planets is through spectroscopy. So, you know, signatures of, uh, of uh, you know, chemicals and uh, elements that uh, could only come from life or a habitable planet. So. Hey, hey, Jerry. Hey, Jerry. Uh, uh -huh. Jeff Weiss asked, uh, can you make your mouse bigger when you do demonstrations because it's hard to follow? Oh, yeah, I, I can I can work on that. Yeah, that's a. If you make handy. it a mouse, does it become a rat? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I can make, make it a gerbil yeah. instead of a. <laughs> okay, make it a gerbil. Please make it a gerbil. <laughs> Moving around on the screen. You have to do that. Remember that, uh, what was it? Remember early on in the internet, what was the, uh, that song that the, uh, I can't remember what the hell it was. It was like a bunch of gerbils dancing. You remember that web page? I don't know. It's just, I can't remember what it's called now. No. No. Sounds funny. Sounds funny. I would like it. It was it was a classic thing back, Hang on. back, in, the, I, back in the early 90s. Hang on. I, I think I have it. Hang on a second. You found it? Yeah. The Google knows all. Hang on. Let me get through the ad. The Google. I call it the Google, too. Is it this one? Uh, hang on. Uh, share screen. Where is share screen at? There you go. I have never seen this. Was this that, it, Jerry? That's at the hamster dance. That's exactly right. It was the hamster dance. That was a classic thing back then. I, it's so classic. All music oh, the music it. is crazy. Yeah, Scott would have to play it just so you could hear yeah. the music. I'm sure everybody that's most people that's on this broadcast recognize that. I don't recognize it. It's before my time. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, that was a big thing. There was a lot of there's a lot of things like that that on the early 19, internet. 1997. Yeah. Hmm. No, can't say. Can't say that I do. I was on the internet in 94. I, the first time I got on the internet was in 94. Oh, I got so a, early I got, or something? My, my, our, the, when, I'm, when the company I worked for, we had a, one email address for the whole company. And it was uh, in 1995. One email address for the whole company. Holy smokes. <laughs> I wonder if it's still active. I bet it's not. But and then we launched a website in 1996. Yeah, I actually had the first uh, personal web page in the Fredericksburg area, and the freelance started article me on in 1994. Um, uh, having that. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, uh, we've got a long night ahead of us. Um, so we're going to uh, close down the uh, show today. Uh, we'll be back on the air here at, uh, we'll be a, a kind of a, you know, we'll be running live with our, uh, you know, our curtain drawn, uh, so to speak, uh, starting at about maybe 7.30 p.m. Central. Uh, you'll see Talking Heads at, at uh, 8, 8 p.m. Central, and uh, we'll be on with you probably till about you know, midnight, one o'clock in the morning. So um, I'm looking forward to some great skies around the world. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you're wanting to join in, if you have something to participate, okay. Um, some people th thought that the, uh, uh, the Global Star Party, if you join and you got a ticket and you join, it was kind of like this chat thing. Uh, that's not where the chat is. The chat is out there with YouTube and Facebook and Twitch and, you know, um, but, uh, uh, you know, if you're in with the group, yes, there's internal chat going on with the, the people that are there, but uh, you have to participate in something. So you have to, 
you have to have some art or you have to, uh, you know, uh, you have to have a, uh, a, a little talk ready or you have to uh, share what you're uh, doing with your telescope. So that's, that is, um, you know, uh, you know, it, with uh, astrophotography being what it is today uh, and, and being on Zoom, uh, you'll be able to share live images from your telescope. And that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, at the very end of the program, we kind of have this open panel where it's, you know, Hollywood Square. It's kind of like what we're seeing right now. Um, uh, and, um, you know, people share all kinds of really cool stories and old photos or new photos. You know, it's, this is kind of for a lot of the people that, that attend this program, uh, it's their most favorite part of the show. Um, but uh, if you want to join, uh, it, all you do is you buy a free ticket. You go to explorescientific.com forward slash to the uh, global party. So, you know. so and then what happens is you, uh, it gives you a, a information on how to get into the chat room that I'll be running. And I test you out to make sure your audio and video are working and everything works. And then I transfer you, give you the, the meeting number and password for the for the full meeting and you get on and Scott lets you in and then you're inside. So it's a two step process. The two step process. Yeah, we just want to make sure that your audio video is good enough for broadcast. So um, and that you're actually uh, involved somehow with astronomy. So that's that is uh, because it's an astronomy show. Um, uh, the Global Star Party is going to be on Saturday. Okay, this will be the European edition of the Global Star Party, and that will start at 4 p.m. Central on Saturday afternoon. Uh, so we we have been running on Fridays. Uh, Gary Palmer and I talked about it, and we thought, well, maybe Saturday would also be an interesting day to have it. So we're going to try it out uh, this weekend and. Um, you know, uh, if you're at all inclined to participate, let us know. Okay. So that's it for today. And um, uh, you guys have anything more to add before we say goodbye? Well, it's good to be back. And good to be back and see everybody on the chat. I, I miss doing these meetings and I'll be back on more of them. Now, Harry, you're going to be, is this your last day? Um, and then you're on vacation or? Yeah, I'm going to be off the show for the next three days. So, and I won't be on the Global Star Party on Saturday. So, I'll be back on Monday. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, that's it. And um, so I will share my screen. Let's see. All these guys say goodbye. <laughs> and here we go. Thanks, guys. And we'll see you tonight. Thank you.